Good morning. My name's Carmel Martin, and I'm the Executive Vice President for Policy here at CAP, and I'd like to welcome everyone, and in particular, I'd like to welcome the Under Secretary of Education, Ted Mitchell, who's going to be joining our panel this morning. We're grateful to Ted and to the administration for their leadership on post-secondary education issues and to Ted's personal commitment to ensuring all students have opportunities for learning. Um, I want to thank all of you for joining what is sure to be a very fascinating discussion about one of the most important issues in higher education today, how to better assure quality. There's been much welcome attention on the issue of affordability in higher ed, and CAP's certainly been at the forefront of that discussion. But it's equally important to lift up the issue of quality. Are students, families, states, the federal government getting value for the investments they're making? This is of increasing importance as the sector seeks to innovate and to meet new demands and hopefully to bring down costs. In recent years, we've seen some exciting innovations in the higher education sector from coding boot camps and online degrees to greater experimentation with competency-based learning. Many of these options look nothing like the brick and mortar institutions that we historically think of when we think of higher education. And some don't even award a traditional credential. At the same time, we've also seen institutions take advantage of consumers. Major for-profit education providers have collapsed amid lawsuits, allegations of fraud, and greater public scrutiny. These trends highlight a difficult balance in higher education. How can we encourage institutional innovation while still ensuring institutional integrity? Today, the balance is managed largely by accreditation agencies, which examine colleges and universities to determine their fitness for receiving federal financial aid. If accredited, a college can tap into the $120 billion spent on federal financial aid each year, which is the lifeblood that sustains many institutions. Accreditors must hold these schools to high standards and protect consumers from fraud but they must also welcome experimentation and promising new ventures. Today we're releasing a, a quality alternative, a paper laying out a new way of thinking about, a quality, about quality assurance in higher education, which we, in which we propose as an alternative to the accreditation process, not a replacement to it. Like the current accreditation system, we propose to have private entities set standards that educational pro providers have to meet. But these requirements would be based entirely on clear, measurable outcomes for student success and financial health. The federal government would determine if institutions meet required standards, granting access to federal aid funds, or removing underperforming providers. This system would streamline burdensome input-based review processes and instead rely on objective, measurable criteria for quality. It would also increase accountability at the federal level for ensuring quality, accountability that would benefit both students as consumers and taxpayers as investors. We recognize that CAP is not the first organization to put forward alternative ideas around quality. That's why I'm very excited for the great panel that we uh, have here today to discuss other interesting approach approaches to quality assurance. So with that, I'd like to invite our panelists um, to come forward to the stage, and I'm going to turn it over to Gold Goldie Blumenstick, who's going to moderate our panel. Um, Goldie is a senior writer at the Chronicle of Higher Education, where she reports on a wide range of issues, especially where business and higher education intersect. She's also the author of Higher Education in Crisis, What Everyone Needs to Know, which was published in 2015. And I'll leave it to Goldie to introduce the rest of our very distinguished panel. Thank you. Thanks, Carmel. Um, well, uh, I think most people here do know who the, on the panel is, but um, to my immediate right, um, Ted Mitchell, Under Secretary of Education at the Department of Education. Paul Friedman, a principal at Entangled Ventures. Ben Miller, one of our hosts today, uh, head of higher ed here at the at, uh, Center for American Progress, and Judith Eaton. Judith, I apologize, president or director? President. President of, the, uh, of CHIA, the Council for Higher Education Accreditation. Um, I, I want to, we're here to hear a little bit about accreditation broadly, but also a little bit about the CAP proposal. So Ben, if you could just start for a second and just fill us in a little bit more on the sort of sure. what 
they don't maybe that pit would, the introduction was maybe at forty thousand feet. Maybe take us down to thirty or twenty thousand feet. Just give us a little better sense of what it is that you're trying to get at here. So the the basic idea is we were trying to think about sort of what are the different components of accreditation and where does sort of the current system seem to do pretty well and where do we see a need for improvement and how do we sort of split it apart a little bit. And so what we came up with is this idea of we do think there's value in having private actors figure out sort of what are the proper measures for judging a given set of programs, but that really where the system sort of falls apart a little bit more is in figuring out how to properly verify whether or not someone's meeting that performance, and then also to really make the call of saying, look, you're really not good enough, we think you shouldn't continue in the system. So we propose to basically split those two things apart. And so the idea is you would have a group of private actors, we're calling them standard setters, come in that would figure out you know, what are the real important quantitative measures for judging student outcomes and financial health? Um, I think the student outcomes part is really self-explanatory. The financial health we think is important because you don't want to sort of open up the federal aid programs to things that won't be around in six months because they're not financially sustainable. And so we think the value here is the private entities sort of know the market, they know what is sort of success and things like that, but they don't then have to deal with sort of all of the other work to collect the data, to verify enforcement, and to make the tough call about whether or not you're meeting your standards or you're not meeting your standards. And we think this is important because one of the things we see about the current system today is that accreditors really are struck with sort of two competing roles. On the one hand, they see themselves as gatekeepers that have to make this call about in or out. And on the other hand, they, have, they see themselves as very much about improving quality and helping people get better. And those two things are a little bit in tension. You know, if your goal is to make everybody get better, then kicking someone out is in some ways as much an admission of failure on your part as it is on the failure of the part of the school. And so we see by splitting it apart and saying, all right, you set the standards, and the federal government will say you're meeting the standards that the third party selected or not. You don't have to worry as much about quality improvement versus gatekeeping. These actors could do all their work on quality improvement. Uh, the schools or the educational providers could choose to go and select someone else to do their quality improvement work but that there's not this tension there anymore. And so we think there's a lot of value in that to sort of make it simpler. Um, that's the basic idea. And like the one other thing I would just note is, you know, we recognize that this is trying to be agnostic as to what you look like. So if you can meet the standards you're in, regardless of whether that's offering a program or an institution, the only other thing I would note is one of our hopes is that for new providers who don't have an existing track record, they would have to provide some concrete data they can meet the thresholds, and we would ask for some financial commitments to make sure that if they test the thing out and it doesn't really work, students can be made whole. But that's sort of the overview. And right, but right now, the, edu the education department does have some financial standards. There's this financial responsibility score. The, there are these heightened levels of heightened, heightened um, federal control that the department can put on schools. Um, so, but it seems to me the newer piece of this is what you're talking about is on the educational side. Yeah, I think that's Not right. Not the financial side, but the yeah. measures of accountability that, on, the on the educational side. That's definitely right. I mean, I would say I think the f current financial side is not perfect. I mean, one of our hopes is slightly more regular monitoring of folks, because one of the challenges is right now we only get data once a year. But yes, I mean, I think the big gain here is very clear-cut measures of student outcomes. And you know, we recognize not everything can be distilled to a quantitative number. In particular, learning does matter. But we think at the very least sort of saying, you know, are students graduating? If they've got loans, are they repeating the, are they repaying them? Can they find jobs that they need? And things like that need a stronger emphasis in quality assurance than they have today. Well, everyone on this panel has, except for me and Ben, have, have been involved in some way in the um, EQUIP program, the Education Department's new experiment. Um, it's an experiment in how they're going to be, how the department will be awarding financial aid, but really it's probably as much or maybe more so an experiment in how to um, do alternative versions of accreditation, alternative versions of quality assurance. Um, Mr. Mitchell, can you just talk to us a little bit about like, what was the department trying to get at there? Yep. So uh, EQUIP, <clears throat> for those of you not familiar with it, EQUIP uh, allows non-traditional education providers uh, to partner with um, universities and, and colleges uh, uh, to develop uh, educational programs that would for that may be shorter in, in duration um, provided by uh, folks who are not usually in the marketplace like but a coding boot camp or a, that would be that yeah. would be an, that would be an example that's the classic example, example but classic, there's other the ones classic in there, yeah. example. Yeah. Um, but key to it as you say Goldie is the opportunity for both parties the university and the non-traditional partner uh, uh, to work with a quality assurance uh, 
organization. Paul will talk to that in, in a couple of minutes. Um, and we're trying to test out uh, the ideas that uh, Ben and his colleagues uh, have put forward in, in, uh, in their proposal about rigorous focus on student outcomes as the basis for determining whether that part the partnership could, could continue. So we looked at a bunch of proposals from uh, um, partnerships and uh, selected eight, and the experiment will be um, beginning in the, uh, later, later this year. Uh, we're very excited about what the experiment can tell us about uh, the, n these non-traditional providers and the services that they can provide to low-income students, but we're equally interested in what the experiment can show us about uh, new forms of quality assurance. As you so said. Um, implicit in that is a sense that maybe the current accreditation system um, isn't really providing a rigorous level of quality assurance? Well, one of the, one of the interesting things about EQIP uh, and uh, sort of un under uh, developed in, in even the way we talk about it is that there is another party to this and those are the uh, institutional accreditors. And so we see this as a way for uh, the current accreditors to be involved in this learning right from the beginning. So the accreditors uh, need to approve the partnership as well as the department approving the, 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 uh, the partnership. And uh, we've had uh, very, very good conversations with accreditors about how best to, to incorporate what they're learning from uh, folks like Paul into their general practice. Judith, you talk to a lot of accreditors. How eager are they to be learning all this stuff from these these upstarts who are coming along and telling them that they know how to do quality assurance better. Um, the reason I ask you that is because you've also, um, through CHIA, uh, you're also going to be working as one of these newfangled uh, quality assurance organizations. What, what were you looking at to this, for this? Well, what we were looking at, and we established uh, several years ago now, 2013, what we called the quality platform, and it was driven by some of the same issues that, that you identify, Ben, uh, in, in the paper, we see an emerging new sector of higher education. Paul represents that in, in some ways. Right here, there Paul, are going to be concerns about, uh, about quality review. This is something not typically addressed through traditional accreditation. So can we develop a, a quality review process that will enable us to make judgments so that students can make good choices? We're protecting students. Uh, we're protecting uh, the public generally. We had no idea with the quality platform that we were going uh, uh, that we were going to tie to student financial aid or gatekeeping. That was not part of the process at you all. We just thought of it as these are good standards and this is a good approach. And, and two other things. We wanted to stress uh, outcomes as central, student achievement as central to judgment uh, about quality and thought this would be a way to undertake that. We also wanted more transparency and creating the quality platform process uh, would enable us to, to test that out. That that was our motivation. It it fits with with what is going on here, and we are delighted to be part of the the equip process. Uh, not only because we think we've got a capacity through the quality platform, um, but also because we hope we're an example, Goldie, of being part of the traditional accreditation community, but responsive to innovation, trying to provide leadership for innovation. Uh, you, your members are colleges, not accrediting agencies, but obviously you speak to the accrediting agencies quite a lot in your, um, is, what, what is the, um, the feeling among traditional accreditors about kind of this push for this newfangled form of accreditation, sort of an out, more of an outcomes focused accreditation? Well, uh, thank you for asking me that because I did want to say listening to Ben, there is a tremendous amount of work on student learning outcomes among virtually all of the accreditors. I think what's happening now is a call for even more attention and to make this central. But to leave here saying traditional accreditation doesn't address student learning outcomes would just be flat wrong. All right. Uh, I think two things about uh, accreditor responses, my observation, not their comments. One, uh, an awareness that the higher education landscape is further diversifying and we will need to address this over time. If, if that weren't the case, the eight institutions in the EQUIP program wouldn't, the eight accreditors wouldn't wouldn't be part of, of that. Um, second, uh, and perhaps more controversial, there is a good deal of concern, I share it in the accreditation community, that as we move forward with some of these alternatives, they are uh, within the context of federal oversight. And I look at your paper, Ben, and I could 
I saw it when, when I was reviewing it as perhaps an example of taking the quality assurance entities in the EQIP program and establishing that as, as a, a permanent quality review process. And that process is by and large driven by federal standards, federal oversight, federal judgment, which is quite a shift from traditional accreditation that emerged from higher education, emerged from a premise of self-regulation and, and peer review. There is a lot of concern out there with regard to that. That it's going to shift, it's not going to become an independent approach, that it's going to become a federal, yes. another federal, yes. as some people would call it, a federal, in, federal intrusion perhaps. Yes. Even though it is, in many cases, federal money that we're talking about here, that's the lifeblood for this. Point taken. <laughs> um, Paul, um, you're also involved with the EQUIP program through Entangled. Um, why did you even get, why did, um, you're a consultancy, uh, why did you get involved in this in the first place? Yeah, um, thank you. And before I start, I, I want to apologize. I'm a little under the weather, so if you hear me sniffling, um, blame the mic, please. <laughs> um, I was going to blame Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so, so you know, if, 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 if the, the cap paper took a 40,000 foot view, let me start with taking a 100,000 foot view. Um, you know, we at Entangled believe that what's happening, part, part of the reason why there's so much pressure in the system right now is what you're witnessing is a change in, you know, the fundamental uh, relationship between the higher education system and society. You know, we've made a transition to a knowledge economy. In an industrial economy, it makes sense to have higher education be a four-year cloistered onboarding experience to 50 years of productive labor. When you're in a knowledge economy, the, the landscape changes. The aver the, an average 32-year-old will have three jobs uh, you know, the average half-life of any new technology platform is two years. So, te so knowledge becomes something that you need always and in, in on demand. And that totally changes what higher education needs to do. And it, so you're having a system that's having to change very quickly. And I come from Silicon Valley where we like to talk about disruption and killer apps. You don't disrupt systems with killer apps. Um, systems move, they're controlled, they change slowly. Uh, and they change by having a lot of experimentation. There isn't one problem right now in higher education. There's many. There isn't one solution. There are many. And when you have to have many solutions, you need many experiments. Um, and the thing about experiments is it's very important to know what's working and have an outcomes-based methodology to determine what's working so you can invest in the things that are working and you can de-invest in the things that aren't. And so our participation in EQUIP was, was very much about that, is to create a framework to have ourselves and really anybody else who has a concern or interest in innovation and quality uh, to have an outcomes-based methodology to determine which ones the new experiments are working and worth uh, continuing and which ones aren't. And uh, I guess the question is, well, a question to ask all these quality assurance agencies, well, who the heck are you? I mean, who's to say you know what's, what's a good outcome? Yeah, we don't, and we don't take the position that we do. So, we, you know, there's sometimes you think problems are new, and then you find that the problems have been sort of solved or dealt with in other areas. And so, you know, there's the, there's there's a the concerns within higher education is that you have a, a there's a real risk of a student being um, mistreated by a higher education institution, a real risk that their time and their money will be ill spent. And so, there's a real reason to protect the, the concerns, um, and there's a there's a good incentive for an institution to sort of falsify what they do and to act predatory. Um, turns out that also exists in the financial s services industry. It's, it also exists in um, you know, publicly traded companies. And so we took a model uh, to approach uh, quality assurance that very much emulated what seems to be working in, in the financial industries around audits and took an, an approach that isn't that the organization that comes in to determine what's working and what's not working needs to be an expert in the business function. What they need to do is create a transparent measure, and they're focused on the measure itself. And so the formula that, that we uh, created sort of triangulates quality around three different principles. You know, if, if, a, if a college exists, presumably it's there because it's solving some sort of problem. And so if there's a problem that you're solving, the college needs to demonstrate that that problem's being solved with measures. And that could be, you know, most simply job outcomes, um, or it could be things like, um, you know, participation in society I I as measured by voting record or, or participation in nonprofit organizations. It doesn't matter what it is, it just needs to be there and it needs to be measurable. Um, we then can determine whether that is being achieved just by looking at the data and whether it's being achieved enough to justify the cost of tuition. And then we go back and we ask the student um, whether that was the, what they actually wanted from the school. And between those three things, a, a determination of a claim, a verification that the claim is happening through data, and then assuming that, and finding out whether the 
the claim was what the student wanted in the first place, we believe that you can, you know, without having to be an expert on the program delivery, can triangulate quality in, across a number of different institutional types. So can I sure, build, build on that and connect it uh, to a couple of other things that, that um, Judith and, and Ben have said? I think uh, the other piece that's critical in the work that you guys are going to do with EQUIP is that that kind of uh, that assessment is a much more continuous process than the current accrediting process. I think that that's another thing we need to remember is that accreditation works um, in five-year jumps, five, right. five, five year jumps. And mm -hmm. I think what Paul's alluding to is that we're at a time when experimentation in the education marketplace is happening at not Silicon Valley rates, um, but uh, 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 not evolutionary rates either, somewhere in between. And the quality assurance uh, process, Ben, as, as you guys point out, has to be more responsive to that. And, and, and I, think that, I, I think that's a shift that, that we have to make around quality assurance, is that it's not just a thing that, that it, it, that's going to evolve um, it, it, on its own. The other thing I want to I say about EQUIP is that among the questions that we asked institutions uh, was, was not just the kind of evidence that Ben suggested about outcome, outcomes, it was outcomes for a particular population, low-income students. Um, because EQUIP, among other things, is trying to put financial resources uh, behind the education of low-income students in a way that's inaccessible today. And I want to use that as a bridge to talk about, I think, the biggest driver of change in higher education, uh, as is noted in the paper, is the change in the new normal student from an 18-year-old who gets dropped off at State U and graduates four years later to the 22-year-old um, returning veteran, the 36-year-old single mom, the displaced worker who's looking to rebuild, rebuild skills. And um, the, the institutional changes that need to happen to accommodate the new normal student are uh, different than the kinds of change higher education has gone through in the last 100 years. And I think we need to think about quality assurance as keeping pace with those changes uh, 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 for the sake of equity as well as uh, e efficiency. It, it does feel like at some level though all these m efforts are sort of focused on a, almost a very instrumental view of higher education. It's, it's here to provide a, a job or a skill or, and I can hear the anguish calls of my old English professors and everyone else that I've spoken to who obviously want to make, they don't think of higher education as this completely ivory tower thing, but that there are a lot of elements of higher education that are not easily to assess with an outcome measurement. And a lot of these approaches are very much, seem to presume that you can just do, that you can do that. I mean, what would you say to those people who want to assure them a little bit more that what you're talking about is not the ultimate, you know, multiple choice test in the end? Yeah, there's so. two, right. two things. First of all, um, difficult is not impossible. <laughs> Uh, and, and hiding behind something being difficult to measure and, and thus you know, stopping all attempts to try to measure it is, is, is not fair game. Yes, certainly there's much more to higher education um, than just getting a job. Uh, and there are institutions that do far more for their learners than just prepare them for a job and that should be, that is part of the value and that is something to measure. Um, but you, you, know, you need to demonstrate that, they're, that you're doing that job. You need to demonstrate, the organization should demonstrate to themselves that they're meeting their own mission. And just because some of those things might be difficult to measure does not mean that they're impossible to measure and I think people are hiding behind the difficulty. The second thing is, there's a big problem, you know, so uh, there's, there's not a problem with having a, a, a college or a program that is providing things other than a job benefit. However, there is a problem with the college or program that's marketing to students that it's providing a job benefit. The students are going there with an expect expectation of a job benefit, and then the school is saying, well, we are only here for critical thinking. That's a problem. So this is a little bit more of a consumer protection approach to quality assurance. So, I mean, I look at it as sort of, there's different stages of quality, and at the bare minimum, especially if you're gonna involve a loan that has to be repaid back, you need to sort of start with a basic question, of what are the minimum things we need to know? And I think once you get beyond that, then you get into these deeper questions of are people learning and things like that. But I guess from where I sit, and maybe this is very, very consumer protection focused, if we're gonna hand someone out a loan, we can't be agnostic about questions around graduation, loan repayment, if you get a job, things like that. Those are certainly not the entirety of the things we should care about and wanna know about, but if we're gonna focus our quality assurance on a targeted manner, that I think is where you have to start drawing the line, and then you can figure out how do we build in some of these other things that we want to know more about. I mean, I think learning is something that, you know, my hope is as time goes on, we will be able to 
sort of know more and more about whether or not people are learning, because I think the science there and the ability to sort of assess that is getting better and better each and every year. But right now, it's sort of not in the place where I think you can get sort of good, clear measures consistently across multiple schools, and I don't think we're kind of ready for that. But. Goldie, I think your question is, is a critical one. I mean, one way to look at um, the approach in the paper is to say it's not a quality alternative, it is a gatekeeping alternative because it doesn't capture those broader issues by design. And that leads me to say, all right, if we do go up this path, diversification in, in the quality assurance or, or accreditation space to match the diversification in the higher education space, uh, what is the role for traditional accreditation when it comes to the examination of these broader issues of intellectual development, of, of students, of civic engagement, of education for life as, as well as work? And uh, I think we would need to see what's going to develop here with regard to the role of tradi what, what I call traditional accreditation going forward because I would not want to, in the name of consumer protection, student protection, efficiency, streamlining, transparency, all those things are really important. I would not want to give up some of the, the very rich core features of what happens in an accreditation review of, of an institution that has a foundation in general education, that has graduate education programs, and that is seeking to make a major contribution uh, to students' intellectual life. So in effect, we're almost seeing this, this role of accreditation, which has been sort of a lot of, accreditors have been wearing to, having to wear a lot of different hats. We're almost sort of seeing on this panel a discussion about really bifurcating that a little bit further. And I don't so, know whether that's good or bad. So I, I, th I think that um, one of the tendencies, and we're about to, I think we're dangerously close to it here, is to do a lot of either ors in it, debates about education. And I think that this is a, a good example of not needing to do that, because I think that the peer review process, for example, that's at the heart of contemporary uh, accreditation historically as well, uh, is a great place to work on, on just those issues. Um, but there's no, as you were saying, Goldie, there's no real need to have those things done by the same entity at the same time in the same review. And in fact, it gets really, as, as uh, both a former accreditor uh, and, a, and a college president, those interactions are, they're really confused on the ground about whether this is a, a, a gatekeeping uh, function, whether it's a peer review function uh, to help an institution improve. And I think thinking about clarity of roles and clarity of, of purposes uh, is, is, one, is one way to get it. The other thing I want to say is uh, um, we had a good long meeting yesterday about, uh, with a bunch of learning scientists. And so I want to uh, echo what Ben said. I think that when we talk about student learning, out, when we talk about student outcomes, Right now, we're talking about sort of the, the, the gross student outcomes. But Graduation I think, rate, retention rate. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think we are getting to the point where we're beginning to be able to measure uh, student learning outcomes, not with a common test across every institution of higher education, but with kind of embedded assessments uh, that enable instruction to be provided uh, in the right place, in the right time, in the right measure. Uh, and to be able to, to, to roll that up, I think, uh, is going to be important in coming years. The other thing, and Judith, you and I talked about this uh, just yesterday a little bit. Um, I think that there is a long tail to a lot of what we credit higher education with doing and being. And uh, I think if institutions uh, want to take credit for that long tail, they have to measure it. And they really have to get serious uh, about civic engage measuring civic engagement, measuring uh, community engagement, uh, measuring uh, long-term health benefits, things that we associate. Uh, and are statistically associated with, uh, with higher education, uh, but I think we have to get, get serious about measuring the long tail. You know, this is all happening against the backdrop of um, action by the education department, even action on the Hill about accreditation, which I think five or 10 years ago, if someone had told me there was a, a bill coming out of uh, the Senate to reform um, higher education accreditation, I would have just like, been in shock because that was not something that our politicians were really talking about. Um, just briefly, Judith, and then um, Mr. Mitchell, if you could just talk to us a little bit. I keep calling you Mr. Mitchell. I know, I Ted, don't know why. I don't know why. Um, if you could just talk to us a little bit about what, you're, what the department has been doing, because I know you've put out some, um, I wouldn't call them ultimatums, but some, um, some, strong regu some strong warnings to accreditors, recommending some things that, you were, that the education department was going to be looking for accreditors to be doing more of. And I think maybe that's a step towards some of this um, 
you know, federal um, intervention that got Judith and her colleagues worried. Um, and then, Judith, if you could talk a little bit about, Phil said a little bit about what the members of the co Congress are talking about. He's so good. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to start or Ted to start? Uh, one, Ted, why don't you start? Um, so accreditation has been much uh, much in the news uh, lately. And, and this is before ACICS, that oh, accreditor yeah. was... Yeah. Um, yeah. De de decertified. Yeah. So you know, what we're what in the in the department of the administration broadly, we, we want to make sure that there is a system, a gatekeeping system to federal financial aid, uh, that protects students and taxpayers, uh, in the first instance, and also provides flexibility for the kind of innovation that we know needs needs to happen. So we've really been trying to encourage accreditors to be both more rigorous. Uh, in protecting uh, students and uh, looking at student outcomes and more flexible in allowing uh, the means to vary while the ends are held, held, uh, held strong. And so we've taken a couple of, a couple of actions that we think uh, uh, lead in that direction. So uh, one is we've um, publicized the student outcomes that accreditors use in judging their institutions uh, because we think it's very important for, for the public to, to know that. Second. We've worked with accreditors to publicize their uh, their sanctions when they when they sanction institutions. Um, what does that look? What do you mean by that? Uh, so that so that we all know when an institution has been um, put on. Oh, you put so, so you're so. putting it on the scorecard That's or something right. at this point. Well, not at the, not on the scorecard okay. at this point, but we are we are. It, it, it's now pub, it's public information. So someone can go to the education department website Indeed. and find it. Indeed. Um, uh, we also uh, want accreditors to take a risk-based approach to their processes. Um, if you look at any accreditor's portfolio, uh, you can just by thinking about the character of the institution say, well, you know, that's a higher risk institution than this one. Sometimes that has to do with size. Sometimes that has to do with past performance. Uh, and so we're encouraging uh, accreditors to put their scarce resources uh, to play uh, on, the, on the risky institutions. Um, and uh, we are doing the same thing in our review of accreditors. There are certain accreditors that we believe are high risk. ACICS uh, is one of those. And so we're spending more of our resources uh, taking, taking a look at that. Um, we also know that uh, communication is key. And uh, the access to federal financial aid is not just a department thing. It's an accreditor thing. And it's a state authorizing agency bit. And we know that we have to have better communication across the triad, as it's called. And so we've uh, committed to being uh, uh, clearer with accreditors and accreditors with us about um, risky institutions so that we can at least know what the other is doing. So these, are, um, these I think, are important uh, uh, steps, but we um, look forward to doing more. Judith, is this a level of um, education department interest that's unusually high? Uh, yeah, I think not only the education department's interest, but Congress's interest. And, and it's, it's not uh, the transparency agenda. It's not only uh, Ben and, and Carmel and, and Dave's paper. Uh, I think there's a remarkable convergence of thinking about accreditation. Congress and the department, that's not always the case. Republicans and, and Democrats. And it's around five things. Do more with outcomes. Be more transparent. Allow or, or provide for some examination of economic indicators with regard to a performance uh, of an institution. Uh, be more rigorous. And acknowledge that the federal role will be a more dominant role, that it will be more a design and hold accountable, accountable role than it has been in, in the past. That's, that's where we're going. I, I think the, pay, the bill uh, I thought you were referring to, Senators Warren, Durbin, and Sots, that, that came out last week is a blueprint for doing that. Uh, and I, I do think it's going to provide the foundation for discussion as we get into the next Congress. And it's a reflective of the thinking of, of places like, like CAP and a number of other think tanks and other members of Congress and the department uh, over the past couple years. Uh, it seemed to me, uh, Ted, in, in reading the Warren Durbin bill that what you, what the department has is its legislative agenda in the transparency, uh, legislative actions in the transparency agenda are by and large addressed uh, in that bill, for example. So I think we're in, uh, at the beginning of an era of significant federal policy shift with regard to accreditation. And if you're on a campus right now, you're the um, college, college president, 
what does this mean to you? I mean, I know, and we could talk also what it means to sort of the, the, the new entrants who are not traditional camp, campuses, but if you're on a campus right now, is this, oh my God, 10 accreditations already, such a giant financial burden and a giant time, time suck in effect um, on campus. Is this just going to feel overburdening to people? Well, I, I think it already feels uh, overburdening some of the time to, to some players. I think the net effect, and I'm not, not pleased about this, is we're going to reduce the discretion for academic judgment uh, by faculty members and, and institutions because there will be more and more oversight and regulation, more and more determination of, at least from a federal perspective, what counts as quality. The institution might not agree in a way our discussion of uh, intellectual development or civic engagement vis-a-vis -vis getting a job is, is a manifestation uh, of that. And so I, I think we're going to see some shrinking of the discretionary space for, for academic judgment at, at the campus level if much of this is introduced. Now, is there a way to deal with that? Yeah, how do we, how do we balance the needed discretion of institutions and the regulation? Yeah, Ben, think, go to, you, know, yeah, you don't, I mean, I you think, don't, you don't think, seem to buy that argument necessarily. I think part of this, though, is that what we really need here is not sort of one approach for accreditation for everyone, but sort of an approach that recognizes that depending upon how good of a job you're doing, we probably need to treat you differently here. And I think that's where risk-based comes in. And so, you know, are there some schools that the accreditation process needs to be much more onerous than it is today? Absolutely. And I think you're actually even seeing that a little bit from uh, the uh, regional accreditors who announced the other week that they're gonna actually start taking a closer look at people with abysmally low graduation rates. I think that has to be a starting point to say, you know, if a small minority of people who start on your campus actually finish, we should probably figure out what's going wrong there. And I think the flip side of that, which we don't talk about as much, is saying, you know, the schools that really do an excellent job on all these things, we probably shouldn't put them through the entire process that we already make them do today. And I think what we're seeing here is less saying everyone's going to be facing more work and more scrutiny, et cetera, and more saying we're going to redistribute this work and this scrutiny differently than we do today. But I, I agree with you, but I'm referring to, to something else, having been a chief academic officer and having been a college president and, and a dean, by uh, requiring standardized definitions, by requiring a certain kind of performance, like perhaps setting levels of, of expected graduation rates. It's not how the accreditor is looking at me, it's the freedom I have in a curriculum committee or in a faculty senate or as a chief academic officer, uh, the discretion I would want and need to move forward in a specific academic direction with my institution. Now, that is vitally important in a accreditation and institutions, if I were a president, I would not be happy okay. with what is happening. Not because accreditation will be burdensome, but because you are affecting my academic and, space. And what if I'm a student or a pers prospective student, which I think is some of where some of these changes are coming from. Um, right now, how, um, actually Paul and Ben in particular, how do you think this, these kinds of new approaches with maybe outside standard setters and sort of an audited model, how does that better serve a student? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think one of the biggest challenges w with with accreditation is the enabling the, the time period that it takes to create new safe space for experimentation. Um, and you know, there the, and, and this year that uh, I had a recent conversation, and it, it's it, I've had a number one, uh, like these with, within the past year. Uh, uh, a, a gentleman who had started one of the most successful nonprofit organizations dealing with um, uh, K-12 uh, school districts, um, you know, globally recognized, um, wants to do something involved in education, wants to provide a, 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 a tuition-free um, college program. Uh, it's exactly the kind of problem that you'd want people to solve, um, and he's exactly the kind of person that you'd want to think about the problem. The conversation then goes immediately to how can you possibly get accreditation for this? As opposed to what's the pedagogical model, what's the student support model, what, how is this gonna actually work? You start talking about 25% rules and 50% rules and you start talking about the, the, the policy. You know, I would say that the, you know, the, the tail is wagging the dog, but I don't think that's ex extreme enough. The tail is eating the dog. There is, there is no <laughs> dog, there's just tail. And I, so I, you know, the, the, I think the, the, you know, the, the, what I'm optimistic and hopeful for and one of the reasons why I was you know, very excited about Equip is I think from the student perspective, there needs to be more institutional choice. There needs to be more different types of institutions, particularly for um, the, the, the students that Ted referenced. Um, you know, there, there has been a lot of good experimentation outside of the system of accreditation, but the problem with that is it means it's only available for affluent students. 
So I think I think this goes two ways. I mean, I think Paul's totally right that you know part of the hope here is more flexibility allows for more new models and more different opportunities in sort of safer contained ways that allow for seeing if it works and then growing if it doesn't. Because we sort of have a bad habit in higher ed of sort of saying this thing, this one thing worked here, let's blow the doors off it and make it as big as possible, as fast as possible. And this idea of sort of smaller experimentation to begin with, I think is valuable. On the flip side, at sort of existing places, I think you know a little bit more rigor here is useful in that I always joke that the larger a school advertises its accreditation on its homepage, the more you should be worried about it. <laughs> Because what they're doing is they're sort of using that and also sort of the ability to then get federal student loans from that as a sign of somebody looked at this, that must mean it's okay. And, you know, in a lot of cases that's true and in too many cases it's not. And so I think greater rigor here would give students a little more certainty that when they see, you know, that it's accredited, that they can get federal aid there, that that actually means something, that someone's checked, you know, the outcomes they're, giving, they're advertising to you are in fact what they say they are and that someone's actually given a little bit more due diligence to making sure that promises made to you will be kept. Um, I think it's, we should um, take a minute now and see what people here, out here in the audience, um, I guess we don't really have a way to do this on a live stream, um, but at least people in the audience, to, if you, in, anyone has any questions about what we're talking about here and, or questions for some of the members of the panel, to sort of, um, let's go a little bit to hear what you have to say, if anyone has a question. If not, we can continue here up front. Are there any questions? Oh. Calm and cool, all right. <laughs> there's oh, wait, there's one in the back. If you, wait, wait, wait for the mic if you can, that way. And if you could say who you are, that'd be great. Hi, my name is Leslie Ford. I work on the Hill. Um, you spoke about measuring outcomes, particularly employment. How do you propose to go about either institutions measuring full employment or the federal government measuring employment or in community involvement or nonprofit work? So I think in terms of employment, I think there's a couple measures. I mean, at, at the very least, I really like the idea of looking at if you've got debt, not how much you're earning just as an absolute level, but how much is your, are your earnings relative to your debt? Because it's asking the question not, you know, is it better to make 40000 or 50000 but are you making enough to sustain yourself on the debt you have? I think the other part is we probably need clear rules of the road around job placement rates. You know, one of the things we've seen is that there are a lot of gray areas there, some of which are sort of always going to be there, but others probably need to be explicitly prohibited. So, you know, right now, some, I think you want clarity that, you know, if you are placed in a job, it means you're actually paid. It means the job lasts more than 48 hours. <laughs> Things like that that seem very basic, but that aren't actually explicitly stated anywhere in law right now. And so I think that's sort of on the employment side, I think where I would start. Um, you know, the civic engagement piece, I'm, I'm less sure of, and I don't have as strong an answer on that. I just want to um, echo what, what Ben has said and talk a little bit about some of the things that, that are, uh, are underway. I think we do need to have a standardized uh, definition of um, job placement rates. And that's one of the things that, that we're discovering as we <coughs> um, look at institutions that have misrepresented those, those placement rates. Um, some of the, the gaming of the system, Ben, that you, that, you, that you referenced. So I think we need to get clearer about, about all of that. Um, you know, we are in the process of, uh, for the first time, rolling out our, our gainful uh, employment uh, regulations. And from that, we'll have the data that Ben describes that will compare uh, um, borrowers' uh, debt to the earnings uh, in career education as they come out of career education programs. And we think that that's going to be, a, be an Im important way of increasing the focus on, on the nexus between uh, debt and earnings, which I think is really the, the crux of the issue. It's not the overall outcome, but it is certainly, certainly foundational. Um, and I think, you know, I just want to take advantage of the moment and say, I think sometimes we get caught up in, in, and go to, go to corners and, and get extreme about this. And, you know, Judith, I, I know that, um, that you're not looking to make space for academics to make decisions to take a 6% graduation rate and move it to 4 right? Right. Um, and, and I think that we just need to, we need to remember that there is a whole lot to be done from the bottom up before we get to the point where we're endangering the flexibility uh, that academics um, uh, and academic institutions uh, hopefully earn in, in our society. Uh, the question, though, it reminds me, and Paul, I'm going to put you on the spot here a little bit. It reminds me that, in fact, there aren't really any standards out there right now for a gazillion things in higher education that we all refer to as outcomes, mm -hmm. or as, you know, either as a, 
you know, a numerical, you know, a graduation, even a graduation rate, that, that's like the one thing we have one definition for, and it doesn't cover most of the students in higher education right now. Um, job placement rates, retention rates, all these things are, are, there's a gazillion different ways to calculate them, never mind the, the, the myriad ways one would want to look at what a student learns in college. And Paul, you've been, you and some colleagues at Entangled and around the country have been talking a little bit about finding a way to maybe standardize a little bit of what we're talking about when we talk about educational claims. Yeah, and I think, you know, as, 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 as Ben and Ted just bo both said, uh, the, f the lack of standardization um, around some of these measures has allowed for the system to be gamed. You know, if, you, if, if there isn't a definition of somebody being placed, then you could say a temporary worker is being placed. If there's a definition of being placed towards their field of study, then you can say you know somebody who um, works in retail that happens to have you know technical uh, requirements is actually employed in computer science. Um, and without standardization, you know that's that's where the gaming the system comes. Um, uh, and so we you know we've been doing some work spe specifically with the boot camp space um, around you know a process to try to. Uh, look at some of the different ways that they're measuring these things and the questions that they're being answered. It's a, that's a nice, talking about safe spaces for experimentation. You know, the boot camp space is a nice safe space for experimentation because everybody agrees that the job is the outcome. The student, the provider, sort of everybody. And so, you know, it, it allows for, you know, a simpler place to start to get some of these things right, um, uh, which then hopefully could be applied where it gets a little bit more messy. Do you think it, there can be some kind of a standard, a broader set of standards for more of higher education? Uh, I, I, I mean, to, to, as it relates to certain things, um, a, a, you know, a, a job placement seems to be the easiest one yeah. to, for, for which there's a, there should be a standard. And I think, you know, to, to some extent, uh, it, there just needs to be less um, manipulating the numerator and the denominator. You know, just put every, put everybody who comes into the top of the equation and see how many people come out, right? The, um, and I think when when you were, what's happened in some of the um, you know institutions that that have manipulated the system, it's it's by Getting determining who counts in the, the the equation, I think it's actually pretty simple to do an, a, a job placement rate. How many students started, and then how many students, you know, get, got jobs. Um, I think some of, sometimes we try to make it more complicated because we're trying to game for a certain, you know, we want it to look good. Can, can I, I, I um, let's not confuse standards and measures. Um, so I think that I think that um, measures are hopefully you know, objective ways of getting the numerator and the denominator right. Mm -hmm. Standards are more normative. And I think the discussion of where the standards are established is, I think, a large part of what um, Ben and uh, Carmel and, and David are aiming us at, is thinking about, all right, if we get the measures right, then how can we go about and who should go about setting the standards? Uh, and then who should go about enforcing those standards? I think that there are three very different uh, um, sets of responsibilities, and we need to get clear about uh, um, how, how to do all three well. And if we could put a, a frame around that, and this is not the case with regard to the, the paper, but uh, I, this did occur to me in, in reading the most recently proposed legislation. Uh, let's not look at all of higher education through the lens of one poorly performing for-profit institution, and they're, they're, they're good performing for-profits. But I sometimes think that's how we're coming at it. We're looking at the worst possible scenarios and saying this is how we need to legislate based on on this I think that would be a mistake bad, for bad, all of us. Bad, it's like in the le in the legal system right a bad bad cases make bad, bad law. law yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> Ben getting back to the paper it's pretty easy to sort of identify I guess what some of the financial indicators would be but what were you guys thinking about when you came up with the non-financial indicators what were some what was driving your yeah thinking I mean that? we wanted to start with things that we thought Obviously, there's debates about how the proper way to measure them are, but they're sort of clearly observable things. So basic questions like, are you likely to finish the program you start? Um, if you do finish, are you likely to be able to succeed afterward if you had to borrow or if you were promised a job? Um, we had talked about some things that I think were like a little bit more amorphous. I don't think we ended up including them, but you know, I do think there is a a, uh, a use of student satisfaction here. I think that matters sort of, you know, would you recommend this program to a friend or a colleague or something like that? I think actually will tell you something and is a useful measure to think about. But, you know, that's where we were really sort of starting to try to go was sort of say, what are the basic questions someone want to know the answer to coming in? And obviously one of those is, will I learn anything? And we felt like that was a place that wouldn't make sense in the construct we were going for, though it is obviously extremely important. But at the very least, you know, Am I, going to, am I going to finish? What's going to happen to me after my finish sort of in economic terms? 
and then thinking a little bit more about sort of what are the other things that it might be important to me, like would I recommend this to others? Things so like in that. effect, for your paper, there's like a government accountability angle and then sort of a student consumer angle. Yeah, we think that's important. Could I ask a question? Uh, my, yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> I, I said earlier, I, I think that this is a gatekeeping alternative, uh, not, not so much or not as much a quality alternative. Um, you're very careful in the paper to say this, this is an alternative, it's complementary, it's not a replacement. Um, I'm an institution. Um, why would I do one over the other? Why might I want to do both? Sure. Um, so our thinking was that if you are an institution that has extremely high performance on all of these measures, there is a lot of value to you because you're no longer stuck then doing the whole self-study, campus visit, sort of all of those things. You have a much more streamlined path into higher ed. So that, that was sort of, I think that's in our mind the selling point to a more traditional institution. You know, if you're graduating the vast majority of your students, they're doing well on their loans, they're repaying, the student satisfaction is high, sort of saying to you, we're gonna get off your back and we're not gonna make you go through the whole song and dance of the existing accreditation system. You know, if you're sort of a middling institution, this system's really not designed for you. You know, we think that really we want ambitious and high bars here and we only want people who really are doing so well. We want, the, we want this to be the sort of thing where it's hard to get in through Pre -check. this path. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So what's another form of differentiated review of risk-based assessment? Yes, I mean, I think that's true for the existing institutions and then we saw this as for the sort of new providers, because we're not emphasizing things like, you know, what are the amount of resources you've got, sorry, what are the amount of physical, tangible resources you have, obviously we're gonna look at your finances, and things like that, then that creates a path for you to come in through outcomes rather than needing to worry about sort of hitting the mark on every single standard that accreditors use today. So might the third party set standards for participation at all in, in this form of, of review, minimum standards, to get at what you're saying? So, I mean, I think the, the idea here is that you have to hit sort of, I, it's fine to think of them as minimums. We want those minimums to be high. I mean, I think one of the challenges you yeah, have a lot of times okay. is the minimum is like saying, you know, you must graduate at least 20% for us to like even look at you. Like, I want to say like this minimum needs to be like a very high bar that you have to clear to get through. Yeah, you know, and I didn't mean minimum in the sense sure. of having very sure. little. I meant, are you going to have uh, an entrance? to the process, if, given that you say this is for high-performing institutions. Right, so. Or providers, I should Yeah, say. so I mean, I think the idea here is you have the standard setters figure out, you know, what are the measures we think make sense and what are the performance thresholds on those measures? And then you have the government sort of take the data in from the institutions that will then verify, you know, make sure people are saying that, you know, if I'm saying I'm graduating 90%, I'm actually graduating 90%, et cetera. And then that's where the inner out call comes in. Who's so they can grant access. Who's a standard setter? Like who's a model standard setter in this yeah. approach? Good question. So I mean, I think we were thinking a couple different approaches. So one actually could, we thought could be sort of traditional programmatic accreditors. And we find what's funny about that is so, you know, now if you are a standalone school that only offers a given type of program, you might be able to get through a programmatic. But there's a lot of programmatic accreditors that are very rigorous for their one program, and they're not looking at the whole school. And this, in they theory, know that could, the engineering program does this, this, and this. They don't know about the general, even exactly. about the general education. And so we were saying, thinking that this could be a path for them to approve just the engineering program, or just the business program, or things like that. So there's a little more flexibility there. Um, you know, we were also thinking that, you know, academic professional societies. So like you think about CPAs, they have clear standards for what it takes to be an accountant, you could see them coming up with like, what are the measures we should care about here? Things of that nature. Um, and the other thing that we like about this is because we're not asking the standard setters to do a lot of other things, they could be sort of leaner operations. So if you saw a few professors or a few others who have sort of knowledge, expertise in the field, maybe employers, something like that, they could come together and form something without it being a huge lift to get off the ground. Because I think that's one of actually the biggest challenges about the alternative accreditation space. And one of the things I'm most excited about with Equip is that you have a little bit of a chicken or the egg problem here, where we talk about the need to have alternative bodies that can act as accreditors or something like that. But because there's not a, pro a place for them right now, they largely don't exist. And so we were trying to think about what can we do to sort of lower the barriers to entry for not just the new educational providers, but also new bodies that could serve as standard setters. And just to be clear in the paper, it's standard setters can't just like 
I can't create Goldie's standard shop tomorrow and start becoming a standard setter. I'd still have to get some approval from the education department, right? Correct. Right. We would want sort of there to be an application of the department where you show, you know, you have expertise here. The other thing we think that's important is to say, you know, that you have to have face validity here. So, you know, if Goldie's standard setter came in and said, I'm going to set standards for engineering, we might not say that you've got it. But if you're saying, I'm going to come and set standards for journalism, we might be more inclined to say, okay, you have expertise here. We, know, we have a reason to trust what you're picking and saying. Great. Um, any other questions out there? Oh, there's, okay, um, in the back. We just lost. If, again, if you could just introduce yourself. My name is Greg Shuckman. I'm with the University of Central Florida. I also just completed a term on the Maryland Higher Education Commission. So this is more actually on that question. Um, with the respect to differentiated schools and differentiated cre accreditation, the minority serving institutions traditionally don't perform, at least in Maryland, they did not perform as well as some of the more traditionally white institutions. Ed Trust does their predicted performance uh, metrics. Is there some accommodation for first generation students, Pell students, minority students, um, community colleges, which have a, a range of different success factors that they look at? So what we were thinking is because you would have standard setters, we're not looking for standard setters to set one set of benchmarks for every single type of school. We want people to come in and say, these are the measures that we think are appropriate for a given type of institution or a given type of program. And so the idea is that within those sort of, if you were going to say, I want to come in and be a standard setter for minority serving institutions, they would pick measures that they think reflect reasonable bars for performance there. At the same time, what we wouldn't want is sort of someone to come in and say, you know, we're just going to say demography is destiny and get, hold everybody to low thresholds here because we just think that, you know, that's what they're going to meet. So I think there's a, there is a balance there between sort of what is the proper threshold, clearly, you know, holding something that's more like a community college to the same thresholds as someone that's, you know, a very high research institution does not make sense. But there's just because they're community college doesn't mean you should sort of say we're going to set the bars at, say, 20 percent or some very, very low rate. Um, um, and I think this is probably going to be our, our host will be our last question. Quickly, just I wanted to get the panel's reaction to two points that I would make in re, uh, response to Judith, your question earlier to Ben. I think the other thing that went through our thinking in terms of them being alternatives as opposed to one replacing the other is that the, the new system, by having a very bright line focus on these outcomes, would, would impact the old system, that it would become harder for the old system to justify a graduation rate of 4% when there was this other system in place. But I do think we were open to the idea that because we weren't trying to get into academic decision making and learning, which I think the old system does and this system wouldn't, I would argue, that if the old system got better at that, it got better on the, the peer review process, that in, uh, institutions might pick our system to get through the federal process, but they might still engage in a peer review process through the traditional system because they felt like it made them a better institution and maybe that could become the gold standard that you know would, would make distinguish between institutions. So I, I would lo just love to hear your reactions. Do you think that that makes sense or doesn't make sense? Um, but that, that was why we purposely didn't try to replace the old system. Yeah, no, I think it, it does make sense in that um, what, what I'm hearing today and other places over and over again is, look, we need to do more as a community, uh, the federal government, accreditation, higher education, with regard to the gatekeeping function. And, and there are lots of ideas out there to do that. Um, I've been arguing over here and a number of other people have. I understand that, all right? Um, but there's some things we don't want to lose, strengths of, of traditional accreditation, and, and these strengths are around the academic enterprise, how to examine it, how to probe it, how to, how to improve it over time, and what you just described is a way of keeping that, that balance. Yeah, I guess I could also imagine it being a school could decide to um, do that maybe in a targeted area. They're particularly interested in just a few, you know, they don't need to have an overall uh, focus of a traditional accreditation model, but maybe focus on a few key programs that are particularly of high urgency for the school right now. Yeah, I mean, accreditation existed long before it was a gatekeeper. 
That's right. And, and it existed for, for a reason long before it was a gatekeeper. And there's tremendous value in the peer review process. There's tremendous value in sharing best practices across like, like institutions. Um, so I, you know, I, I think um, that it were there an alternative um, uh, s system of accreditation that focused on the gatekeeper function. You would have institutions, even if they were sort of entered into Title IV because of that pathway, would still want to participate in all the other benefits of, of traditional accreditation. But I think, I think your suggestion is a logical outgrowth of the paper, but also, I think, of, of, our, of our conversation here today. And I guess I would just like to say, I think that the, the change that we're making is an important and positive one uh, in focusing on, uh, on outcomes and the discussion of what outcomes and how do we measure them, I think, is a very, very healthy conversation for, uh, for higher education. And the idea that we would um, look to create pathways for new entrants into higher ed uh, that wouldn't necessarily require all of the same inputs and processes, um, but would achieve desired outcomes according to the mission of the institution is a highly creditworthy enterprise. Um, obviously, we're still very early days on all these kind of ideas. I think, but I do, I can't imagine that we won't be hearing about outcomes assessments in the future, audited approaches in the future, and uh, third party standard setters. These are all going to be phrases that I think we're going to be hearing a lot more about in the uh, years to come when we're talking about quality assurance and higher education. And with that, please um, join me in thanking our panel today.